Hello and welcome. Today I'm speaking with author and historian Jack Dempsey. Jack is the author of several books and currently lives in Crete, Greece. You will find more about Jack and his work in the video description below. Today we'll be talking about the ancient Minoan civilization of Crete, which has been the study of much of Dr. Dempsey's study. To begin with, Jack, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the Minoans, how the civilization was discovered, maybe something about their origins? Sure. Well, I've been studying the Minoans for about 40 years. Always wanted to be an historian, a writer, to know my tradition inside out so that I could thereby contribute something to it. But I think it's only fair, Bill, that today we give a, the, the viewers a warning up front, a positive warning, you might say, and that is when this is over, if you've paid attention, your war helmet will no longer fit. Your war helmet will no longer fit right once you know the true facts of Western civilization and not the story they told you in school, which proves only how inevitable our current mess is. Instead, with everybody looking for the garden, the utopian society, the garden, the heaven on earth thing, it's remembering we are already in it. How do you behave when you're in a garden? You don't thrash around destroying everything. You respect it and you enjoy it and you explore it. And that's how we're supposed to be living. And that takes us, believe it or not, directly into the Minoans. I discovered them for myself 40 years ago when I really wanted to get back to the bedrock of all our traditions, written, archaeological and otherwise. And bang, there they were in an art history book, the most glorious life celebrating culture you could probably find. And I mean, still anywhere. And I'm wondering why I was never told this before. Well, a quick nutshell of a introduction summary on the answer to that question is, in the year 2000, the beginning of our millennium, National Geographic published a magisterial issue that began Western civilization with one of their great multicolor fold-out centerpieces. And it was all what's called Mycenaean gold, Mycenaean weapons, Mycenaean animal hunts, scenes of conflict and whatnot, all in gold and the glory of ancient Greece. And in the sidebar, it said these people, the Mycenaeans, learned much from the Minoans and earlier, more advanced people. So I'm thinking, why did you go out of your way to tell us that you're not starting at the beginning? Mm -hmm. There's some kind of a conscience there that says that we have to pay homage to the facts, but we don't want to feature the facts because it would give you a whole different idea. Okay, so Minoan archaeology begins around 1900. A Cretan man named Minos Kalokarinos first started to dig into the mound that was covered with olive trees in a little undescript, nondescript valley called Kenosis, about five miles from the Aegean Sea, inland on the north coast of Crete. Nothing particularly physically remarkable about it, especially when you contrast it with other locations. So nobody really understands what was the original significance of this place. It might have been the first inland camp that some of the first ancestral migratory people made. And since, and there's a reason to think that in the sense that the Minoans ever afterward were totally dedicated to their ancestors. We know even before they built the palaces that they were taking very careful care of the stone-built tombs where their ancestors were laid to rest. And later, when we get into the, the wonk of, of Minoan civilization, we're going to see that the symbols for the ancestors, particularly the horned mountain, the twin peaks, or the double pair sometimes if there's two of them, represent, as they did in Egypt, there's an Egyptian hieroglyph called Jew. D-J-E-W, that means the ancestral valleys either side of the bed of the Nile River. They buried their dead in these mountains. Okay. And so the horns come to signify Egypt on either side with mountains, and therefore the tombs, the resting places of the ancestors, where we came from and where we're going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the discovery of the Kenosis so-called palace around 1900 by a Cretan, Sir Arthur Reffens, the uh, an English aristocrat who was also like Henrik Schliemann before him, exploring the ancient roots of Western civilization, had a feeling that there was something significant in Crete. And he went and he met with Carlo Carinos. They began to work together. 
Uh, and with Evans bringing in all kinds of resources to clear away the the dirt, the trees, the rubble from this mound, more and more and more of this majestic uh, Ashur masonry building was mm -hmm. uncovered, full of labyrinthine passages, a throne room, uh, all kinds of official state and you could say public celebratory uh, uh, features. Now, okay. to jump ahead a bit, the archaeologists nowadays understand that this was not the palace of a royal dynasty or a king and so forth. This was a building erected in by, by equal polities, different groups of families, clans that is, that came mm -hmm. together to build what you might really think about as their ages Vatican City because it became their central ceremonial center. <clears throat> Maybe, excuse me, maybe a little bit like Oxford in the modern day. In other words, all the Minoan so-called dependencies, the wide-flung villages, towns, other majestic built buildings, must have been grooming the best of their culture to, as you would might say, go up to Kenosis. You seem very gifted at agriculture. You seem very gifted at astronomy. You seem very gifted at dance and ritual. You seem very gifted at metallurgy whatever it might be, and the best of their own knowledge was repository there, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. for over 2,000 years. So wow. Evans is looking at the spectacular find, and when he uncovers the throne room with this beautiful alabaster throne built right into the north-facing wall, he says, the throne of Ariadne, and then proceeded to name his magisterial study, the full volume, the Palace of Minos. At Kenosis. Okay. So he was an aristocrat imagining a Minoan aristocracy living off the work of the peasants on the landscape, our early English style. But the more archaeologically sound thing is now that the Minoans had the highest average living standards of their day. They had everything we'd call high tech for its time. They were extremely eclectic, but also extremely careful about what they borrowed and didn't borrow from their surrounding neighbors. They were very much insulated by the sea and by their island, its distance from all the other major powers of the day. So they had a lot more freedom with which to play. And if there's anything solid, and I know there is in a book called The Dawn of Everything by uh, David Graeber and David Wengro, he will tell you in his pages about the Minoans that, well, if this was just another kingship and patriarchy, it's awfully unusual that such leaders would represent themselves by lavishly focusing all their painting and art attention on women. Right. There are a lot of men that are featured in prominent ways, but as partners, as participants, there's a gender egalitarianism as well as the highest average living standards that was de rigueur for this uh, Minoan civilization we're looking at. So in, in I'll shut up now if you want to ask me some follow-up questions, I'll try to paint the shape of this thing. The Minoan age, runs from about 3,600 and there are earlier digs, 6,000 and even 130,000 in Crete now. That's how long human beings have been going there. But the recognizably Minoan cultural period from about 3,600 to 1,200 or so, we're talking longer than the Roman Empire, both Eastern and Western things. Mm -hmm. This is the longest, most continuous, most relatively peaceful, most dynamic civilization on Western record. It really seems as if you might get away with saying we got it right the first time, but wow. all this was 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 conquered, was erased, was burned, insulted, maligned, caricatured, and so forth. But now, in the in the great gift of archaeology and objective, or as objective as it gets, international examination and re-examination of all kinds of evidences. We're seeing that, well, what I said would hold up. It was the longest, most successful period in Western history, and we know virtually nothing about it. Centrally because women were extremely mm. central to this, what we're going to call, I think, for today's discussion, a matriculture, a culture built around the mysteries between nature and women, the sources of life and human women who understand the plants, the seasons, farming, weaving, ceramics, gold work, on and on and on. They are the builders of society and they are recognized in Crete for that. 
you brought up a lot of interesting points. And um, one of the things I was thinking about when you said this, at first of all, I was not aware of how early the, there were human habitation there. But um, we have spoken before about uh, the historian uh, Maria Gimbutas and her yeah. theory of, of about how about old Europe. And she points, for instance, that the evidence in the burials of the pre-Indo-European invasion peoples of Europe, that when they're buried, they're buried with men and women next to each other with no apparent rank or hierarchy. There's no weapons. Well, you could say it's because they they it was they didn't have bronze. They only had copper. So anyway, they did they had an agricultural or hunter gatherer society. And then with the Indo Europeans who had spread out from um, the steppes of Russia, they on the to the contrary were very patriarchal and very militaristic. And their burials obviously have rank. There's the great man. And they throw in a bunch of kill a bunch of his wives and slaves and stuff and put it in there. Even put horses in there and chariots in a tomb in a tomb a hillock called a kurgan. Yeah, kurgan. That's the name that goes with all this controversy between Jim Butas and Colin Renfrew. Yeah, you're right. So go ahead. That's the, that's why it's called I suppose called that theory. But they're also buried with piles and piles of weapons, and so the. Um, that spread of that culture, which is spread throughout the entire West and North Africa, and is the, their language is apparently the, the basis of our language, but also the patriarchal or social arrangements that we yeah. have. So the idea is there are very few cultures in the ancient world that weren't wiped out and erased by that. And it appears that, well, at least linguistically, the Minoans, and and maybe the uh, some a few other ones like maybe the Etruscans were not Indo-European and had a different uh, social arrangement. And but, between those two, the Philistines and the Philistines. But also, I've noticed um, this is when I was in Portugal. I uh, saw a lot of this uh, remains of these megalithic cultures. Yes. Of, of which they really know nothing about. They but they were probably okay. illiterate. But along with you know going back to the uh, what you were talking about with these symbols is that with this megalithic culture you see there seem to be and commonly understood uh language of symbols because yeah. and and so that i see you know when i see these uh the uh, the etruscan civilization for instance and when i went to these places i would see things that reminded me a little bit of the Minoans in certain ways. Sure. Uh, and yep. so they have I have a want... common heritage. Do you so, want to, you know, I mean, part of what Jim Butz's contribution is, and that's part of it, is that she puts in a an immense new foreground and context what happened to us. Hmm. Think about it. We've been human beings for maybe 250,000 years, symbolic writing, uh, quasi-writing, at least symbolic markings and etchings and paintings with an amazing sympathy for the natural world and affection yeah. down to the last detail that creates lifelike movement in, a, in whatever medium they, they choose to, to work, right? Now, 250,000, you contrast the known recorded quantity of years in which men have ruled the roost with a militant king and so forth, maybe, Bill, 3,500 years. Yeah. Do the math. That's less than 1% to 2% of our history as humans, and yet it has shaped everything we're facing right now. And it's, it's acting as if it's always been this way. So yeah. let me, as you asked me before, with Jim Butas proving that there was a matricultural uh, uh, dominance even in the remains and the tremendous transition between that and the Kurgan culture, which right. came in with the Indo-Europeans, right? Mm -hmm. That really is a conflict between agricultural settled communities and wandering hordes of a war state. Yeah. A war state, that was the highest value and virtue in their culture, and you can see it reflected in, in virtually all their objects. The inheritors of that in the European theater, picture Crete out in the middle of its ocean, living this matricultural 
joyful, high-tech, dynamic, steady state of a culture, living in the forever now with the seasons cycling through it. And here come this offshoot of the Indo-Europeans that we began eventually to call the Mycenaeans. Mm -hmm. They smash into the Greek mainland. They remove, replace, enslave, denigrate the so-called Pelasgian cultures that were there before them, very closely tied with the Minoans and the Chicladic cultures, you know, the famous fig figurines in ivory and, and uh, alabaster of them standing like this there. It's believed to be a kind of a shamanistic culture. And mm -hmm. Jibutas worked on that very culture in the Cyclades with Colin Renfrew. So they knew each other as, uh, you know, quasi-competitive, very contrasting fellow scholars and diggers in the soil. So I'm trying to keep Jim Butas at the head of all this because of her incredible impact and performance. What we started out in is that surprise, there's the Minoans. We've never been told about them and their success, right? But Jim Butas helps us come down to earth with both feet on the ground to say, what's really the surprise? This is how, for the vast majority of our time, we have been as humans and we have been grossly misled by ideologies, by iconography, by charisma, and all these other blandishments into a suicidal, life-hating mess, okay? So the Minoans present a way out of that. If, for the benefit of the audience, let me give a couple of comparisons. So Knossos really, there are pits there that date to 6,000 BC, other wow. places that date to 10,000 BC, and just two years ago, in the southern part of the island, a place called Plakia, they found these beautifully worked white quartz axes. And these are, well, almost absurdly dated, yet 130,000 to 700,000 wow. BCE. Okay, so people have been coming here a long time. Knossos is as old as the great famous now Gobekli Tepe, which is around 9,000 to 7,500. It's, it's as old as Catal Huyuk, 7,500 to 7,000. Old as Malta and a contemporary of the beginning of the Minoan period uh, distinctly is with 3,600 to 2,500. Okay, so then and we're going into the periods that Evans classified originally and has been greatly modified by the archaeology to say there's the pre-palatial Crete, 3,600 to 2,000. The old palace, 2,000 to 1,600. The Thera eruption around 1650, 1625, the new palace, 1600 to 1200, and then post after these various disasters and the invasions of the Mycenaeans, the taking over of Crete by force happened. So just to sum up here, this is easily 2000 plus years of clear cultural continuity in change, development, evolution on the ground floor of Western Civ. It's 500 years, if you're a Giza Pharaoh uh, fan, 500 years before the first pyramids, wow. uh, it's to the end of the Egyptian empire in the Middle East around 1200. It's 500 years before Stonehenge, which is dated first about 3100. Yeah. That which is into the Minoans Palestine. They invented the land through their name of Palestine and met the first Israelites. And it, their independence ended 1,300 years before Athens was a so-called democracy. So it's, we should get into the difference between real democracy and Athenian democracy, too, if we want to really understand where the Minoans yeah. are coming from and what they mean to us. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, most people understand the Romans and Greeks, for instance, to be ancient. But they're, we're actually closer in time to the Romans than say the Romans even were to the Egyptians, you know? So there's ancient is much more ancient than, than people realize. But the mm -hmm. other thing I wanted to point out is I've seen where Rimfro has come around or came around at least a yeah. bit, you yeah. know, uh, and had to admit with new uh, evidence that he, that he wasn't right about everything. Yeah, but, and Renfrew was a heavy hitter scholar, so he knew the range of evidences, archaeological, oh. linguistic, DNA, mitochondria, the, the uh, examination of ancient pollen, and so forth, right, right down to the details. And he found that Jim Brutus was, quote, largely right after all his objections to her theories. And Jim Brutus finally 
you know, was proven in the sense that, well, if you look at the pottery and the fragments and the designs on the pottery that Shimbutas' major, uh, majestic work shows you, you're going to see almost all those forms later in Minoan work, Philistine, mm -hmm. Etruscan. In other words, usually the marker here is of a people who are paying attention to nature. Yeah. Paying attention to nature. Whereas the kingly realms from the Mycenaeans to the... Uh, uh, Israelite to the Roman and so forth, they're always trying to blandish you with these grandiose mm -hmm. representations of themselves, the pharaohs too. And the right. Minoans were really having none of that. They're thriving out on their own island, doing very well for the longest period we have, and we don't know about them. It gives you a small idea of why now your war helmet no longer fits. Everything I've said is borne out, I promise you, in the details of archaeology. Go to my website called Jack Dempsey Writer at WordPress.com, Jack Dempsey Writer at WordPress.com, and you'll see a piece there called The Catastrophe Cycle. Mm -hmm. This is what we've had for 4,000 years charismatic, loudmouth, bloviating individuals who know the way forward for us all. And they have a great hoo ha while they conquer somebody, steal their wealth, and then fall to pieces. So yeah. we have an inch. We have an inch of progress for a mile of blood. Well, I know that's, that's not necessary. It's all about control of the narrative, then and now. So, uh, I, as you point and out, it's a paper thin control too. Right. As you notice, as you mentioned Graeber's book, and first of all, I should tell people that he cites y your research in 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 that book, but that. Um, as he, points out, as he points out that uh, the story that we commonly have of everything always having been uh, patriarchal and everything leading to now and leading to capitalism and the inevitability of it, that really isn't the story at all. And that there have been multiple experiments throughout time of different types of social arrangements. And sometimes people in, would go and say, live in cities in highly hierarchical uh, situations and then decide they didn't like it. And then everyone would just leave and abandon it. You know, That indeed is why his book is this thick, yeah. showing you that again and again and again, that people don't forever stay in the same place in the same relationships and the same confines. They like to be very creative with their cultural inventions. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we say patriarchal, it immediately maybe launches the word matriarchal into people's minds, which is a no-no because it suggests for both detractors and people who want to represent the minorities correctly, a regime of women that has their neck on, right. the, on the necks of men. But look at the Minoans carefully, and I've seen people do studies of tens, tens of thousands of their signet rings, for example, the mm -hmm. representations of men and women in proportion and blah, blah, blah. And it comes out just about equal, just about equal. Yeah. And the one of the funny things I like to point out, too, is that whenever you say that, well, the Minoan women were so powerfully elegant and honored with these uh representations that show them as just the supreme you don't know whether it's a goddess or a woman they're right. always exactly the same and i love that ambiguity about them you never know the deities from the human individuals and that's that's a message in itself right but why do you uh, think there's such uh, there seems to be even now such resistance to the idea that uh that things weren't always patriarchal like there's uh, for instance there's T uh, channels on YouTube where uh, people who, uh, you know, historians or amateur historians that I really like, but they are very resistant to that I that idea. They seem to feel that that's the idea of a uh, woman central centered or even women even having any kind of equality in the ancient world is a is a fantasy and a fairy tale, you know. And, and these are usually the same people who tell you that the Minoans had slaves without a slightest right. bit of evidence. Show me yeah. the burial pits where in Rome and in other realms, uh, the slaves, the inferior population were just buried in, in heaps with complete neglect. Show me those things. Show me the chains. Show me the other apparatus that you'd need to control a labor population. The instruments of terror, the, the emblems of authority that you must not defy. Just show it to me. 
just show it to me or shut up. That's what yeah. I usually say, because you don't know what you're talking about. A lot of people, too, Bill, they're either the academic or just the general public, <clears throat> because from the academic to the general public education, things filter down right over time. A lot of them got their education hearing that thunderous, horrible word matriarchy and imagine yeah. just what I told you. And so it's natural for them and probably for us to say, no, no, it's not any, anything like that. It's not authoritarian. It's not women on a male model. Right. It's an organic relationship between civilization and the earth, that human beings are just another of the many species that are reveling in existence. So that all sounds ding, 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 too much utopian for them. So now they move it from the terra matriarchy box to the utopian box and right. figure out for you all kinds of twisted, unevidenced reasons why it was nothing of the kind. Every 10 years, it seems to me right now, we'll be in uh, 68 there's a new scholar that makes his bones by saying all the Minoans are actually warlike. Let me show you all the weapons. Let me show you all the scenes of contests. Uh, and all contests, meaning sport, is preparation for war. That'll yeah. do it right in. Uh, that'll do it right in right there. So I think there's a tremendous resistance that, <clears throat> like the guy who, and I'm sorry, I don't know his name, but the guy who discovered plate tectonics mm -hmm. was ridiculed for a century and more, for the very idea that the earth under its crust moves and continents travel and so forth. And then he was discovered to be right and slowly rehabilitated. But the viciousness and the exile and the ridicule of all kinds of new discoveries, uh, it's kind of the norm. So we're just gonna have to, well, I'll interrupt my own sentence to say, I'm grateful for your program, Bill, because you're helping to bring out the clarity of the message that it wasn't always this way. It was changed against us, and we can therefore change it back for us. The garden is remembering we're already in it, and right. it's according to how we behave toward it and each other that counts. Well, this brings me to another thing we've talked about. And uh, so, you know, talking about the Indo-Europeans, besides being patriarchal, they were also uh, expansionist in a militaristic way that they sure, you have to go out and get those foreign resources ever uh, expanding from pillaging and stealing and and growing in that way so in what way was the minoan uh economy or social arrangement different than that well if i can paint in one sentence the change most visible in crete in my impression of all the archaeology i can lay hands on is that Crete instantly, almost instantly, became a much more hierarchical society, much more closed off between its elite and the countryside. Most of them were destroyed, the elders put to the sword, pillaged, and so forth. There's even one house where it was pillaged with such rage that nobody bothered to look in the basement first, and there would turn out to be 19 big, labyrinth-shaped ingots of pure bronze, wow. already mixed comp copper and tin. And so this is a, more than a king's ransom of fortune that testifies to the rage with which these people were, were taken down. But contrasting that and its sudden drastic arrival, what you've got to say ultimately in a sense is the, the Mycenaeans pillaged their teachers. They had been learning for about 500 years from the Minoans how to build cities, how to write, gave them a word for the sea, how to farm, because they needed to settle down, as even though they were conquerors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Mycenaeans pillaged their teachers, and then after all the vast years and centuries of Minoan achievement, you had about three to four hundred years of Mycenaean rule, which finished mm -hmm. up with its last hurrah around the walls of Troy. Mm -hmm. So they were forever predating on other cultures for resources, for slaves, for horses, and they didn't last a, a virtual blink of an eye. So turning from that to the Minoan civilization that they encountered, you have to say, if, again, if it's if it's matricultural, matri what does that mean? And I'd just like to name a few of the traits. Uh, first, again, as I mentioned, according to really distinguished archaeologist Jeffrey Souls and other people, the Minoans are a long central toward their ancestors. They're really careful in remembering how their ancestors lived, why they were successful and healthy. And if you kept in harmony with them, you were going to do all right. The land was held in trust among matricultural clans that together were called the Damos. 
D-A-M-O-S. This is an ancestor of the word demos, the public I was gonna say, yeah. population. Yeah, they're directly related. But in the Minoan Damos, everybody was included because they're households. It's an mm-hmm. economia, a the 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 maintenance of a household to the benefit of all its members. And the Mycenaeans later were acting according to what we call now in the profit system, crematistics, profit at any cost, profit at any cost. So the Minoans really, you could say, had very little in common with them. And it's not still understood how the Mycenaeans insinuated themselves into the island, probably first as students and cultural learners and diplomats and whatnot. And then eventually, well, what's halfway between a place with no king? And I can show you that to a place with a unilateral, lifelong, exclusive power holding king. Halfway between those is a hero. Right. Something like a Theseus that must have come to Crete, done some stunning deeds, was offered a a hand in marriage with a Minoan uh, elite woman. And then the marriage didn't work out, just like between John Rolfe and Pocahontas in the new world. It was only too late when she discovered what they really thought of her. Okay. But given the Minoan economia, the language, too, is is on the side of a matricultural arrangement because the word wanasa means a powerful woman or a group of powerful women, like in Native America, squaw arch. OK, the group as well as the squaw. That was a, a term of honor originally. Mm-hmm. And that wanasa, wanasa is older than the Mycenaean term wanax for king. This has been confirmed by people as estimable as John Younger, real expert in Minoan languages and so forth. So the Minoan economia function among different centers of power, fiercely independent, fiercely different culturally, landscapes, all these things, they converged on kenosis in the sense of keeping their time, their cycles of the moon and sun in order, so that they could orient their agriculture and their ritual life to be in harmony with the ancestors, the double, the double horns and the right. Minoan double axe in between those two horns. Okay. Okay. This is a realm that leads from the underworld of the ancestors through the star door. Because mm-hmm. just like in ancient Egypt, it was not a contradiction for them to say, my ancestors are in the ground and they're in the stars. So the Minoans in the late period began very much to try to convince and and cajole people with iconography and other rituals and lavish displays and whatnot, that if you stay with the original ancestral Minoan ways of life, you will still do okay through these periods of the uh, Thera volcano disaster. And then about a hundred years later, still, that's a long time to be looking at the consequences of the Mycenaean invasion. But in the practice of their economia, everywhere you go in the Minoan world, you look at their architectural ruins and you see these little benches everywhere, indoors, outside, around the perimeter of a building. This is where people would talk and have their sacred communions. They would share sacred meals. And you don't just sit there in mystified silence. You socialize, you talk. Who's the big man or the big woman today? What did they do last week that I don't approve of? And the Minoans, here's a, 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 a kind of a, a fruit of this democratic participation, or democratic, is that the Minoans of all the kings that we know about in antiquity were the only ones whose king, so-called, had to renew his power every eight or eight and a half years. He's the only one who faced any kind of critical evaluation, and if he failed that, to be removed with another. This is, again, in keeping with at least native northeastern America, where the sachems, the big showman and the talking guy and all, he was appointed and deposed at will by the damos, by the women's, the Squatch society. And right. all the produce that they had garnered from the land were what he was giving away as munificent gifts to please allies, to renew social bonds. So finally, to go back, the economia in general then worked among all these different Minoan centers to be sharing power in this way. The Antikythera mechanism over a thousand years later is a series of disks that tells you what time it is, as it were, in the lunar and solar cycles. And on those disks also are etched the names of Greek communities whose turn it would be next to host the festival. Okay. And so the Minoans, no doubt, were sharing 
hosting the festivals like in Bali today or in Native America, the potlatch, the important thing is to give away as much as possible, to throw the biggest party you can imagine. That's how you win your power and influence over this next period. And it would move these centers of celebration all around the island. Mm -hmm. And so nobody ever got too powerful, just like the Minoan so-called king, better to call him maybe a CEO of some kind, had to face evaluation. And you know what the biggest find is in Minoan archaeology, Bill? Mm. The biggest number one find? Little drinking cups, about yay big. Little drinking cups at the temples, on the mountaintops, inside the closets of the palaces, so-called. Little drinking cups, Mm. sharing things, sharing things. So this is the soul of the economia that is fostered by the damos that is ruling and organizing the Minoan world. One final grand example is that in the Minoan throne room, there's a pattern of decoration in part of its frieze or picture that it presents you overall. And Nano Marinato's brilliant uh, Minoan archaeologist noticed that this matches the hem, the only surviving fragment of a queen figure's skirt who's greeting people coming into the labyrinth with their gifts to celebrate and share. And she says this says to me that the person who sat most on that throne was a woman and that their connection, the throne and the woman is architectural, architectural. So it is that strongly confirmed that we're looking at a really sophisticated ancient matriculture that was dynamic even as it held a steady state within nature. Well, I noticed you mentioned the double edged, uh, the double sided axe. Which Elaborous, yeah. Has in modern times become a, uh, for some people, a symbol of feminism. So, and I know you have an idea, and you spoke a little bit about some of these uh, symbols that are in the architecture and in in these things. And and so I wonder if you could speak about that. And also, what's if any is this connection with the maze and the bowl and that type of imagery that the uh, Greeks and Romans you know, connected with Minos, if, if there ever was a Minos. Uh, sure. I, I would put the, the last two things just first to kind of get them out of the way for a moment. Okay. The bull, like the lioness and the griffin and the snake in Crete were the four the snake, yeah. uh, uh, cyclical seasonal totem animals. The, the bull of spring, he must die to feed the lioness of summer when the children must be fed and the crops harvested. Griffin carries you spiritually to the stars, into the mm-hmm. realm of death, and snake oversees your rebirth. So mm-hmm. that's basically how their cosmos worked in a naturalistic sense. The Minoans were watchers. They looked first at how water runs, and they built their stairways and drains accordingly. They mm-hmm. looked at how light changed with the time of day and built and structured their rooms accordingly. And the most important essential of that was the throne room, because the throne of Knossos, this was discovered by archaeologists from the UK, Lucy Goodison, I think 2000, and she published, been vetted. The throne room and the throne itself is touched by the light of winter solstice. It's concealed from outside by four doorways, a double pair of doorways. And the light comes in the southern doorway and hits the throne, just like it was set up in Egypt many times, so that the rebirth of the sun at winter solstice, its weakest point, also touched whoever was sitting on that chair Mm. and reinvigorated the whole spiritual society. Now, the complement to that, new moon at winter solstice is full moon at summer solstice, six months later. It's a reliable astronomy verified cycle that is still going on in our skies. It's an eight and a half year cycle. In other words, new moon went to solstice, six months later, full moon, summer solstice. Now they're both at their peaks together. This is what every calendar does, the harmonization of lunar and solar time. But you don't have to do it in one year with mathematical fractions. You can do it by looking in the sky and -hmm. realizing that those two phases signify the harmony of lunar solar time over an eight and a half year cycle. Every time those four events take place again, the cycle renews. Now we move to the throne room and to Labras. 
the back of the throne against which you lean while you're sitting there has four waves on each side and mm -hmm. a ninth point at the top. Okay? okay. The labrys, hold one in your hand, looking at it with the double wings, right? I can't really do it with my hands too well. Oh, okay, maybe there we go. All right. Mm -hmm. You've got one, two, three, four points. Mm -hmm. Turn it around, five, six, seven, eight points. Plus one at the top means nine. In other words, the cycle culminates in the ninth year. It's eight and a half years, but it culminates in the, by that half in the ninth year. Now, why double it? Why turn it around? Because the most practical, the majority of examples of these double axes we have are practical tools. Mm -hmm. And you could, by having a double ax, you could not have to stop your work to resharpen. You could just flip it around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, there are other things in nature, like if you look at the moon every, every night for a month, there's only two times a double pair when you're going to see the same face on the moon. Two days when it's full and two days when it's black. Double pair. Okay. So you turn it around. That's how the Minoan's iconography works and ties together. The fresco, and I won't go into the wonky detail of that today, but I can show you in the book called Calendar House at my main professional website, ancientlights.org. Okay. It's called Calendar House, ancientlights.org. The minute detail of this is easy for anyone to understand. The Minoan symbols tie together for the first time once you understand these central forms and what they represent, most centrally the cycles of the moon and the sun. And here's a more uh, complimentary thing that uh, will stop me here, but I think it's really remarkable. For all the doubling that you're going to see in Minoan iconography, that's when they really rib you and say, pay attention. Pay attention, there's something powerful here, right? Doubled pairs. Um, mm. If you take that tableau of the throne room, it represents eight and a half years, okay? Double that period, mm -hmm. and you get 17 years. Now, 17 is one year short of the cycle of eclipses. In mm -hmm. other words, if you're going to claim through your iconography that you are the kinsman of the sun and the moon, and you understand the great cycles of nature that shine down on everybody, right? You've also got to be able to talk about the shadows and the eclipses that d seem to disempower both those bodies at the most unpredictable times. Funny enough, on each side of the throne, there are X's, a certain number of X's that correspond to six and six. Well, mm -hmm. in the six months, I've done this with computer simulated astronomy, astronomy over about a 4,000 year period looking at these patterns. Six and six makes one year. Mm -hmm. So that means that in the six months preceding the beginning and end of a cycle, and after the beginning and end of a cycle, you're gonna see an eclipse of the sun, the moon, or both. That's about as sharp as the Minoans could put it. The later Greeks invented the Antikythera mechanism to try to study up on that. But you know, it's, it's only a, a a measure of their understanding of these cycles. The 19 year cycle is not really a dependable, usable, reliable, everyday calendar for where we are along right. the near term. Whereas the eight and a half year cycle, remarkable consistencies across every repetition of it. What phase the moon is in and what's the sun doing? Very, very accurate. They're not launching satellites. You only need to be within about a day of right. correct and you'll be okay. Well, it's interesting because I, discovered that the for the ancients the sky the nighttime sky was like the television of their day and mm -hmm. uh it's interesting that modern people don't look at the sky uh, i mean you're they very can't. you're barely aware of it especially if you live in the city you can't even see it and yeah. so the suburbs you, too you don't have any connection with that and or with the seasons really because we've created like you can control temperatures you can have in the modern world in the west at least you can have whatever you want any time of the year you don't know for christmas don't know where it came from doesn't matter uh and so it, it creates a divorce from nature you, it's a disconnect yeah. so it's yeah. the idea that you can just keep using and using and using and using and it's like inexhaustible and there is no limit to it and it's you know just whatever 
you need to feed your attention or ego or whatever it is. You just, you know, keep it's an inexhaustible supply and it's not contingent upon the seasons or or anything else, really, you know. And, you, you know, I'll tell you something else. It, it, what you're saying is exactly correct because it means we're losing our anchors. Once mm -hmm. we are separated from the true realities of our existence, you can be pushed this way and that way with an electric cattle prod or propaganda or whatever they want you to do. You have no frame of reference anymore. You can't mm -hmm. even see the night sky. And if that doesn't give you perspective on how small and, well, unique we may be, right, that's mm -hmm. a starting point for a lot of counter thoughts that the system of money, which counts on predictability, and the system of maleducation, which counts on being smart enough to turn the screwdriver and stupid enough to think it means anything, mm -hmm. right? The, the, all these golden means of patriarchal Christian, Judeo-Christian capitalism are predatory mechanisms. They prey on us and seek to control us so that they can wield our power for us in foreign adventures, whether they're this planet or the next. It's just going to be one conquest after another. It doesn't work. The war helmet doesn't fit anymore because that's not what the facts tell us. And the garden is already here. We're, rem we're trying to remember we're in it. And therefore, there's our anchor, how to behave. Yeah, I behave. Pretend you're in a garden and suddenly it's a whole different planet and a reason for living. I wonder what the if any connection the Minoans had with the uh, cultures of the Near East, because some of these things like the garden and these things are are uh, almost tropes of Near Eastern uh, religion, yeah. and spirituality. And another thing that the Greeks and Romans did uh, they they stopped, which is I uh, know that in the Near East, for instance, they often had a when things got too bad or the economy got out of control or something, they would have a reset. They would they would like absolve all debts would go away and you'd start a jubilee. Yeah. yeah, yeah, jubilee. A jubilee. You'd start all over again and yep. and and equalize. You know, no, that's unimaginable now. But apparently, the Greeks of course it is. set that precedent. Of, of stopping that practice. You yeah, know. well, so. you know, it, it, I've said it in other contexts, but we are, we become who we honor and who we imitate. Mm -hmm. And once, why we're saying the war helmet no longer fits when you know this stuff is because we've been, un, we, we realize we've been imitating the wrong ancestors. Mm -hmm. You know, here's again, our strictly speaking, archeologically supported generalizations about the Minoans. They had and respected all the way into the classical period where the writing really started, right? The mm -hmm. rule of law was more important than the individual in their system. And that's why they were able to prosper so long. They didn't set up a war state behind a king to conquer foreigners and thereby lose their own lives. That's the catastrophe cycle that I mentioned earlier. They believed instead in the limitations on power. Look in the sky, man. Sun is an infant, a helpless infant on New Year's Day, winter solstice. And then he reaches his peak on summer solstice. That's today, Bill, by the way. Happy mm -hmm. summer solstice. Oh, happy yeah. summer solstice. Okay. <laughs> that, proves yeah. that proves our point too, doesn't it? We, were, we wouldn't know unless we were been told that today is the summer solstice. But I can mark from my terrace here over the sea in Greece where the sun comes out of the ocean or out from behind a mountain all mm -hmm. year round. And it moves back and forth like this. But it's to say all, even the greatest, most potent powers known in the universe, that for them was the sun and the moon, have limits. They have right. a peak and then they fall and then they're reborn and they grow again. And you see, life is mm -hmm. circles within circles. And if if it's... Mathematics, you want the Minoans had the highest average living standards of their day. They knew all this. Imagine the generations of astronomy alone that it must have taken and the heritage and the inheritance of observation. No, it goes like this when that appears. No, it does like this. Now, tomorrow you can expect that's only the seasoned astronomer and observer watching. And for all that, for all that attention span, they're exuberant. They're having a ball. They're playing with animals. They're dancing. They're playing music. They're sharing food. They're sharing drink. 
This is what they most like to do. Who could throw the biggest party? Okay, you can call that competition. And it has been in a lot of anthropology, from Bali to the potlatch, South and Central American social rights and so forth. Okay, but it works out a whole lot different, doesn't it? Because every time you get together in festival and eat and share food and your daughter intermarries with your cousin's son, you're tying the bonds, the social bonds. Now, if somebody cheats somebody else, your mother-in-law comes to get you. (laughs) And that's worse than the police, man. That's worse than the police when the community comes to get you. And that's still true in Crete today. Up in the mountains here, they don't have police forces patrolling the towns. They have family courts, like the Roma people still do, and so forth. The Minoans were supremely creative and technical with all that going on. And women are the part of our species, at least according to modern research, that tend to end poverty. If you invest in women and give them a share of a credit bank, they will turn it around into profitable, uh, fruitful endeavors for their once impoverished community. That's happened again and again and again. So there is, I don't want to be essentialist at all. It's not bad men, good women all the time. Absolutely not. That's not even loyal to the archaeology. But there is something about the set of matricultural beliefs that can guide us as to how to live in nature. And I'll leave you with a funny line. The, uh, a lot of the anthropologists for a long time referred to Canaanite, Philistine, uh, even Minoan and other things, religions as fertility cults. Mm -hmm. fertility cult. All they wanted to do was have sex all the time and be completely reckless in terms of the children that they raise and all this. Well, you know, who built the cities? Right. For the world, who developed the resources, right? And so fertility cult, if you look behind it, what does it mean? It means a body of practices, values, traditions, knowledges that result in the community having many healthy children. Yeah. Fertility means many healthy children. So what you mentioned several things about uh, the anti anti I, I, that's a tongue twister. Antikythera. Antikythera anti- mechanism. Mechanism. And I'm glad you, you brought that up because that brings me to what evidence do we have of, first of all, their technology. And then you talked about some things like like long distance messaging. You talked about at one point and other oh, yeah. things. And, and also, um, you, you know, what, you know, we know they were traders and uh, that Everywhere. seemed to be, but what did they trade and to whom? Well, I think that their number one commodity in universal demand was olive oil. Okay. As somebody said, there's simply no substitute for all the things you can do with olive oil. And the Minoans and the Cretans today are masters of growing olive trees and processing all their fruits, okay? Second, Cretan wine, because not everybody had grapevines either. These were gifts of Dionysus and the goddess uh, Demeter, I think, from the olive tree. No, Athena, Athena. Mm -hmm. And so the Minoans had those two staples going for them, and that's why we find shipwrecks full of these tall pithoi or jars that contain also, they probably did not export much grain because there's not a lot of uh, grain farming country here. Mm -hmm. It's very mountainous and so forth. But they also are known to to have uh, exported to Egypt finished goods, Mm -hmm. beautiful ceramics, lion's head ritons, uh, jewelry with little animals and duck necklaces, duck's head necklaces and all kinds of crafted things that people could find nowhere else in the world. Another natural product was, I guess you could group them under unguents and oils and aromatics because they had very rich uh, arbor life here, the tree range and uh, knowledge for processing the gums and unguents and things that come out of those were in high demand. And they went in these little beautiful jars called pixas Mm -hmm. and they would stack them inside other larger jars with straw for safe transport across the sea. And wasn't the color purple from the murex? Was that them or no? Uh, it, it was to a small degree. There's a place, okay. I think it's called Melitos, 
on the north coast of Crete, about 50 miles, maybe 100 miles east of me here in the center of the island, mm -hmm. uh, that is believed to have had a plant of some kind, a factory structure for crushing and processing murex shells into purple dye. But that became the real trading uh, asset of the later Phoenicians, who were offshoots of the mixture between Philistines and Canaanites, mm -hmm. as well as Syrians, Lebanese, and, and so forth. Yeah, I know there are um, Egyptian um, uh, murals that it's believed that depict the Minoans uh, with these objects that you've talked about. Um, yeah, and by the way, I want to mention everywhere they go to, and there's a Minoan settlement or even post-Minoan, infinite numbers of spindle walls, mm -hmm. spindle walls, these little stone-shaped weights that would hang on a uh, shuttle for making textiles. The Chicolatic people and Minoans too were known for beautiful textiles. Look at their look at the fine detail of their frescoes of their own garments. God, the it, it'll just knock your socks off. The color and the inventiveness of design, and they're even from Santorini, now called Santorini. Excuse me. Uh, frescoes that show a young girl holding a diaphanous textile between her fingers. <laughs> And looking at the audience, like you can see right through it, and it's beautifully rendered that way, but you know there's something there. So they were famous for the most fabulous textiles as well. And those bring huge returns in gold from Egyptian mines, in tin from Babylonia, in uh, grain from the Egyptian coastal delta, where the fertile farming land was. Uh, all kinds of metals from all around the compass of the Mediterranean. And an interesting contrast further that we get from archaeology nowadays, this is codified by John Younger, is to contrast the way the Minoans behaved in foreign countries with the way the Mycenaeans behaved. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look good for the Mycenaeans. The Minoans would come in and say, we want to mine your basalt, or mm -hmm. we want to take some of the obsidian that makes conchoidal edge sharp implements. Okay, what are you going to do for us? Well, we'll build you a port, and then mm -hmm. you can bring in even more good stuff. We'll build you a waterworks so, or, or a key so that you could be protected with your own ships from the winter waves that come really fierce all through those uh, times. The Minoans were into building installations and having close relations with the indigenous people of the different places that they went to, even loaning painters out to house the many houses of the Middle East and to Egypt to just say, paint me a nice Minoan landscape or something. You do it so pretty. And they did, right? Well, the one thing I was half remembering is something about them being able to signal from mountaintops. Ah, yes. There's a study now, a, a school of study called uh, view sheds. In mm -hmm. other words, you go to the most important, highest points of the Cretan mountains which are in, I think, three great ranges across the island. You can, it's already been very much uh, explored by archaeologists, a guy named Pete Field and another guy named Shepard. He'll kill me because we're good friends and I can't think of his name, <laughs> but he's done actual physical studies of your ability to tilt the sun in a polished disc to make signals, okay? Mm -hmm. And this has already been shown to be easily doable in the short distances among the best, highest Minoan peaks. Mm -hmm. So you could send coded messages 500 miles away at the other end of the island and get them back the same day and so forth. Not, it's not a smoke thing. It's a, a sun-reflected thing. So mm -hmm. this is what some people call the beginning of mass media. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, here comes one signal from Kenosis. Is everybody ready for the next eight and a half year celebration? And they all say, yes, we are. And they say, well, where is it going to be this year? And Zachros or Malia say, it's going to be us coming here during the new moon. And they mm -hmm. must have, if they had that kind of communication, not just for security invaders on the West Coast. And, right. But, but to, 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 to draw their communities even closer together despite their differences of distance and culture. It's called heterarchia. It's a sharing of power among many different groups of people. 
So the next thing I uh, we wanted to bring up was uh, the Bronze Age collapse and uh, it, what role of anything that played in the downfall of the Minoans. And also we you mentioned their possible connection with the Palestinians. Yeah, um, there's a whole school of apocoporn, as they call it, that always mm -hmm. in ever higher tech tries to rehearse how the Minoans were destroyed and oh. ended and finished, but they didn't end. They weren't finished. Uh, the important thing is how they lived. So mm -hmm. what happened was maybe 1650, 1625, it's still not very certain, but it's somewhere in that range. Enormous earthquakes shattered almost all the Minoan centers. Then enormous tsunamis, not just one, but you get one and you go in to help people that have survived and another one comes and gets you. A mm -hmm. series of tsunamis that brought the sea bottom all the way up into the hinterland. Okay, just mm -hmm. unthinkable 200 foot going 250 miles an hour waves hitting wow. the place. Now that's going to salinate wells. It's going to poison cropland. The ash fall was mainly falling on Crete and the ocean and reached a little bit of Egypt and the Middle East. It was simply the enormous, the, the most enormous eruption in ancient times, bar none. Mm -hmm. But even so, part of the land, well, the, the mark of Minoan history is they had been shattered before. Almost mm -hmm. every 500 to 800 years, there was a major earthquake in Crete that shattered most of their best built buildings. And they simply learned how to build better by adding slats of wood between the blocks so the walls could play with the shocks. And so Seismic building yeah. retrofitting. Yeah, exactly. So they, I don't think, would have been held down very long, even by the Thera tsunami. They had enough food amongst themselves to get by. They had lots of sources of water that were not affected. And a lot of people are beginning to question this sudden disaster and end of the Minoans model at all, because it's not until probably at least 100 years later that the Mycenaean influence in Crete really starts to show mm -hmm. in burials of warriors with, as you mentioned earlier, their masses of weapons. And they have their favorite jar that they got somehow from the Pharaoh of Egypt with all his bloviating language on and about, he is the lord of the islands and you shall rule them and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But while there was then a very violent and very unproductive, if you might say, Mycenaean occupation of Crete, because I defy anybody to tell me something that they did to Crete's benefit. Everything they did was taking away from them. They reduced the Kenosis Syria spiritual world and cosmological center with a counting house. They were counting every sheep, every pint of wheat. They were rationing out a, a little handful of figs and wheat to each slave that they were happy to name was in their possession. And yet lavishing pages, as it were, of attention on the shaping of finials, golden finials at the top of a very special, important man's chair. Okay. Mm. So these kind of cultural changes drove many of the Minoans into the wild mountains, and they found many fastnesses there that no large force could approach because when you get to the penultimate point of the new settlements, they're always very narrow in approach. You can't put more than one or two men up against you at a time, and they just pick you off. You'll never get them, right? Mm -hmm. Others of them went overseas to every direction in the compass. Troy. Anatolia, Alicarnaso, Canidus, Kaunas, other places like that. The Middle East from, uh, what's the name of that city? Uruk, no, Ugarit in Ugarit. northern Syria, down into the Middle East where the Minoan painters and survivors were known to have been living because they've been doing business there for hundreds of years already. Mm -hmm. Egypt, Gaza, whose original name was Minoa, as the Minoans mixed in with their many neighbors to get away from the conquest of their country, they contributed quite a lot to those places. One of them was Palestine. Now, the quick summary of the situation there was the pharaohs, as probably everybody knows, used to come in there and just ravage everybody, smash through all the little kingdoms that were acting up in rebellion. This happened perennially. Take mm -hmm. as much wealth as you could get impose heavy taxes with a heavy presence of soldiers and governors and 
supervisors and all this kind of stuff, a real colonial operation. Well, by 1275, the Egyptian claim on the Middle East was being matched by the Hittites from the north in Anatolia. They had a terrible battle called Kadesh in 1275. And sure. guess what they decided to do once they had both exhausted themselves in a land that belonged to neither one of them? They decided to intermarry and mm -hmm. make trading tra trading treaties and so forth. Gee, I think maybe the Minoans were right. They've been doing it for 2,000 years, and maybe they've got something there. So they started doing what the Minoans had long been doing. Many of the post Minoan Cretans via Cyprus for a couple of generations landed around Gaza and the southern part of what is today Palestine because one of their tribal names was Pulisati, Peliset. The okay. they're the ones yes. with feathers. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's some of them. And they came there because a, a great wing of their migratory movements was a war party. They attacked Egypt to try to grab land in the Nile Delta to build themselves new homes, right, where they wanted to be. Seven rivers accessing the ocean. The whole world is before you, and you've got plenty to eat in the, the Nile's breadbasket. Well, they lost the battle, and that's an interesting story in itself, how and why, because they had a virtually superior force. So Pharaoh, and this is from his records, took them and placed them with supplies, with help, into Gaza, into the southeastern, southwestern corner of the Middle East. And he said, you, with your experience, are now going to patrol the roads of my trade between Egypt and Babylon, Egypt and India, so forth. And what we know archaeologically is that once they were settled in, Egypt became, began receiving waves of wealth waves of wealth from the Far East and trading it back in dyes and uh, produced uh, artifacts and whatnot. And where was this coming from? It wasn't from overtaxing the Middle East because that's not what the local wards record. Okay, they gave their bushels of wheat to the temples of Egypt and the priests had to be fed or they'd sick the army on you, okay? But for over 250 years, once the Philistines were the guardians of those roads of trade, Everybody did pretty well. The Philistines were burning in their incense burners. This is from Aaron Mayer, an Israeli archaeologist, very distinguished and amazing scholar. They were burning cinnamon and nutmeg in their temples to their divinities. The only place you could get cinnamon and nutmeg in those days was Sri Lanka. Mm. So that's how far the Palestinian, the post minoan Palestinian, Philistine peoples reach was in the progress of all this Eastern trade. Now, what happened was a Northern entity called the Israelites, and the word hostile and aggressive has been used by Israel Finkelstein and other Israeli mm -hmm. scholars, began to interfere, it appears, with the trade along the highways, mm -hmm. so that they were probably extorting so much of the value of a given caravan's uh, freightage to themselves that they became an obstruction to trade. And that is what kills people every time. You get in the way of Pharaoh's income, he will come and smash all hell out of you. And that's exactly what they did under Sheshonk. So the Israelite kingdom, once they had dispossessed the Philistines, lasted all of about two or 300 years. Well, I know the trade- The end. end. And lo and behold, excuse me, we're just getting down to about a thousand BC. Lo and behold, within 100 years, guess who shows up in Italy? People called the Etruscans. Interesting. I, yeah, I don't know if there's any connection, uh, but you have yourself have seen, I know, from your trip to Italy, shapes of the double X yes. crescents with the disc between them, the sun, the moon, or the pole star in between them. That is a Minoan motif. You Fair find enough. it in Egypt. You find it in Carthage. It's everywhere. So that to wrap up here, Bill, because you mentioned first the Antikythera mechanism, mm -hmm. that is why these forms of time persist, because people are using them. And that's normal. We wouldn't probably give up our calendar, even if a catastrophe hit our civilization tomorrow, whether it's famine or disease or earthquake or all of the above, which that's that's how I see it, what they call systems collapse. Um, You're talking about the Bronze Age collapse here? The collapse of the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. We just discussed the Iron Age in the sense of right. the Philistines uh, arising and arriving in 
the Middle East and so forth. That's that's Iron Age, even though they really didn't have iron in much distribution yet at all. Uh, but 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 that's how all this fits into beginning of text, because from the Homeric epics, which were written down seven, eight hundred years later, after the Mycenaeans had vanished through their own greed. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible, which was not written down another 800 years from mm -hmm. the time so-called of Moses and all that mm -hmm. text begins to be central. And so as Barbara Moore and I used to say together, we lost context. We lost our anchors in reality and we were given instead a text. And is that not just what happened when the Europeans eventually reached the new world? Forget all you think you know about animals and plants and medicine and all these things that you people do. We mm -hmm. have a book for you. We don't ourselves even agree on what the book says, but you're going to love it or it, else. That's interesting. Well, first of all, the trade routes were vast in the ancient world because in yeah. the Bronze Age, one of the necessary ingredients with tin, which largely came from what they called Bactria, which is Afghanistan. So imagine that route how far away that is say from egypt or something and the know? beautiful dark blue stone called lapis lazuli that right. was coming from afghanistan in the minoans yep. day to go on to some of their necklaces so that's what the bronze age collapse disrupted that trade which led to a hundred few hundred years where just everything disappeared uh, and well, but, I wouldn't it, I wouldn't say it was even that long, though, because no. uh, scholars now, historians and archaeologists, a guy named Yasser Landau, for example, published mm -hmm. a book about three years ago about the Philistines. And he finds that they were coming into the country in small groups. They were not predators. They were not destroying every city they laid their hands on. They were already mixed through centuries of trade and mm -hmm. interfamilial relation was a part of the context of their trade at all times so they knew these people so even under the radar of history you might say even though it may not appear in the text because the recording historians didn't know about it i believe that these trades let's say through gaza the spice road at gaza meets the ocean and mm -hmm. those two worlds can communicate i don't think it was very much of a dark age at all we just don't know about it but people are people they keep their economies going they go where the action is and you know, I don't think it might have been quite as dark as we've been led to believe. We just haven't been looking in the wrong places. Well, one point you made about the text, um, I'm thinking about that from the evidence is that with the uh, Phoenicians, uh, you know, the beginning of, of, of uh, text, that what did they write? It was accounting. It, that's really is the beginning of the text. Almost all of the same as the Minoan writing. It's just all accounting. It's business. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they're the, not creating they're not creating representations that glorify leaders and right. agendas and propaganda. They're not interested in that. They're living life. The eternal yeah. present cycled through by the seasons. That's all there is. There is this artifact which is contested, and I think it's believed to be a fake. But you know what I'm talking about, that round, uh, they believe it's some type of early printing uh, that the Minoans, it, it's contested that if it's really Minoan, but it, it repeats. Oh, the Festos disc. Yeah, now, what, what's your, is that real, do you think, or what? Or, or what? Well, it, it's real in that I've seen it in the, in the museum. Uh, it was found by, supposedly found by an Italian archaeologist who uh -huh. was kind of working off by himself in a section of the place called Festos, another ceremonial center in the Mesara, the greatest flat plateau you ever saw in the south stretch of Crete. Mm -hmm. The syllabary in it has many things in common with some of, let's say, Linear A, Minoan, I'm still unknown because there's not enough of it, Linear B, the Mycenaean, a text called Cipro Minoan, which was flourishing in the island of Cyprus under Minoan tutelage and some of the scripts from the Middle East. It's a hodgepodge of many of these features. And it supposedly shows a Philistine in a feathered crown mm -hmm. about five centuries before there was any such thing, if that is a Philistine, might just be a Cyprian. 
anyway, many people are dubious about it because it's taken so long to unravel whatever it is it's saying. The latest theories say that it's a prayer or even a song written in spiral form. Okay, but others ha are really dubious about it because of the finding of it, the uniqueness of it. There's only one. Yeah. If it was, a, if it was the first CD or some other storage, easy thing to store information on, it should have been in common uses when instead we get these right. ragged strips of clay called the tablets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one main reason to doubt its authenticity, its uniqueness. But we don't know, did it come from Crete? Did it come from somewhere else? And the museum itself, the Archaeological Museum of Heraklion, refuses to allow any kind of chemical or testing analysis. They, but, with, a, with an almost microscopic needle drill, they could take a sample of, its, so of, of the clay that it's made of and see what that could tell them, but they're not being allowed to. So hmm. maybe, maybe the suspicions about the object are more widespread than we might think. So to sort of sum things up, um, what do you think that, I mean, we, we've spoke a little bit about this, but what are some of the things you think that contemporary people can bring away from Minoan society and, and uh, their spiritual beliefs, their culture, their social arrangements? Hmm. Well, I have, I have a few things that I've written down, but I'd like to speak more extemporaneously about that because it's, it's it's near to my heart, you know. Uh, I mentioned first that what we need is a revolution at the very core of what we think we are. We become what we honor and imitate. We've been copying the wrong people. But suppose we started thinking that divinity is imminent. I mentioned in Minoan iconography, you can never tell a deity from a human being. And we ought to start thinking that, you know, they, like they say, still in Greece today, the stranger is sacred. Be kind, be hospitable, because you don't know whether or not it's Zeus in disguise, meaning mm. that this is a spiritual being who's come to you, and they need to be treated with respect. Another one, this is something that I think the modern world will dig, is that connection is erotic. Mm -hmm. we, we give ourselves all these means of connection, but it doesn't connect us. Mm -hmm. There's no erotic within it. It's all this empty Im information and commercialism and instead it ought to be facilitating a new global system of festivals where a different city every year hosts a celebratory of being alive festival including sports games and feasts and all kinds of commercial meetings of the minds and this is how it worked they were called the gardens of aphrodite in those days you never knew who you were going to meet mm -hmm. and meeting them you never knew what was going to happen next but that could be an awfully fertile thing for the exchange of information and, and even cultures. Another one is that the life is cycles within cycles. We've talked in a sense because of the Minoans about nothing else tonight. Everything return, life returns from death. And I'll tell you something about living in Crete in eight years now, it'll be eight, nine in August. I see a lot of death here, semi-rural, a lot of animals from the insects to the birds, to the cats and the dogs and, and the people, there's a lot of death present, and we've got to realize that that's part of life, not to give into it, of course, who, who, who wants to go that way. But death is not the opposite of life. The opposite of death is birth. Yeah. Life has no opposite. You think that through, and that's a pretty majestic fact to me, and we ought to respect nature as the true and only embodiment of that divinity and of the life that's in us, that's so dependent. I mentioned that all the great powers of the universe have limits. People need to respect that cultures should have limits, economies should have limits, executive power should have limits. And as soon as we betray those things, we lose big time. Um, the Minoans, I think, would say to themselves, be your most, be your best self, be your most beautiful self in complementarity to the ways that other people express their best and most beautiful self. Another one, and this goes right to the turning around of the double acts and all these other kinds of operations in their calendric and this, their political system, take turns, give somebody else a shot, take yeah. a turn, but remember that in a sense we're playing a game. 
There's nothing to kill or be killed about. And that people are basically good unless they get too much power. That right. to me has been the rule. People are good. They usually do the right thing. And that's what makes the, the, the world go around every day. We miss that. We're so upset and disturbed by the violent exceptions that we forget that the norm is human cooperation and goodness. People are good as long as they don't get too much power for too long. So we come and return. We come from and we return to our family. We only have forever now amid the seasons and the changes of our bodies and our lives. And what matters most is daily life, not ideology. And you know where that's from? From a description of a Minoan ritual center. It seemed to matter less who the people were than the doing of the deed itself. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. There's a there's a kind of a quicksilver. They're not interested in the ego so much as the doing of this group of beings. Well, you spoke at one time, and I, I probably sh I should have brought this up earlier, but I think it's an important thing to to that ties in with what you said. You spoke at one point, I remember, about the uh, sort of symbolism in the uh, bowl inside of the maze being uh, a, a sort of symbolic of controlling the ego or controlling the the savagery of, of the self. I don't know if you remember. Well, for the Minoans, the bowl is a simple symbol of ramping energy and power. He was the most powerful beast in the Minoan world that they could see with their own eyes. And they even have these beautiful golden cups called the Bafio cups. And you can see it in detail on my, again, my blog, Jack Dempsey, writer of WordPress.com. There's a piece there. It's the most popular ever of all my pieces called uh, Cosmos Erotica, the, mm -hmm. the erotic in Minoan life. The bull was a creature that they're even laughing at themselves. You cannot contain him. But the metaphor, you see, a later Greek wrote that Daedalus built the labyrinth for King Minos in order to contain the flesh-eating monster, the Minotaur, right? But what that means with a Minoan aspect to it is we tangle power up in time. Mm. We have a system that holds him off, holds him back. We don't conquer him. We don't destroy him. This meat or human eating war system that sometimes gets the better of us, we 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 can't defeat it. We can only put it off. Mm -hmm. We can only contain it within a, a labyrinth of rules and guided steps. And that's finally what a meander or a labyrinth pattern is. It's really a set of guided steps through a ritual space that I think ideally returns you to where you came out. But you need to keep your wits about you at every turn. The classic labyrinth, you have to use every carter only once. That's the rule. So you have to remember which way, have I been here already? Maybe I should go this way now. You have to remember and figure out your bearings and uh, your direction. You have to keep your wits about you to get through this, this trial. So it's about containing the worst of our nature and about a spiritual education system that, well, endows us with patience, with taking turns, alternation, limitations on power and your own possessions and all that good stuff. I think there's a lot there that can reverberate in the minds of, of people and there's multiple connections there. I think that's a, a good spot for us to end on because- And let me just add one thing though. Again, I, I put this in an article of mine. Nothing I've told you today is not supported by the archeology, span by mm -hmm. the hardest ass archeologists you could ask for. I'm mm -hmm. only generalizing from what I know that they've seen, that they've shown. OK, and that's what this book Calendar House at Ancient Lights does. It simply takes other people's discoveries and matches them with others to see how they come together, all the pieces. And that's the kind of thing we've never known before. What was the Minoan system of time and what was their central political idea? Those mm -hmm. have been two mysteries for all time. And nothing I've told you is not supported by the professional's work, I promise. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Jack, and we'll see you again here on Pictures and Words. Bill, I want to thank you very much. Bill Miller, tremendous host and 
hospitality pal and we've been friends for a long time and I wish this whole series lots of luck and uh, God bless you until next time my friend. Thank you Jack. <laughs>